Hi, my name is Jeff Carver. I'm a professor at the University of Alabama, and this is the lecture on quantitative methods. This lecture will serve as a starting point for more detailed discussions as we move forward. So as a bit of an introduction, uh, when we think about statistics, we have two different kinds of statistics that we can think about. There's descriptive statistics, and then there's inferential statistics. We also have to consider another uh, key concept as we move into statistics, and that's measurement scales. So the measurement scales affect the type of statistical test that we can conduct, and we'll talk more about these as we go through the lecture. But they're things like nominal, ordinal, interval ratio, and that just really affects what type of mathematical reasoning you can do about the data itself. So if we think about analyzing results, this is a be an introduction, we'll get into more details here in a minute. But what we're really looking at is we're looking at analyzing frequency distributions. So for example, suppose we want to know whether the students from two universities differ in their use of active learning. So let's say we have 20 people from University A and then 20 people from University B and we ask them if they use active learning in their in at least half of their courses, yes or no. So there's our question. And then let's say we get data that looks like this. So from University A, we have uh, 15 who say yes and 5 who say no. And then from University B, we have 8 who say yes and 12 who say no. So let's say that that's our data. What we want to be able to do then is answer a question about whether there's a real difference here or not that means anything to us. So the next step would be to perform a statistical test to analyze that significance. I'm not going to talk about that just yet. I'm going to talk about a few other topics and then come back to how we might actually test this question out with uh, a statistical test. Another kind of analysis we might want to do is correlation of individual scores. And this is when we have uh, not, we don't have distinct groups of subjects, so we just have one group of subjects. Um, the individuals in that group may be measured on multiple variables, so in this case, let's say two. And so what we're doing is we're looking for a relationship between those two variables. So let me just give you a really simple example. Um, suppose we want to know if there's any relationship between the course average that somebody has in this particular course and their overall GPA. So let's say that's the average we care about. So maybe for each individual we have their course average and we also have their overall GPA and then we can plot these and we can see is there a relationship there or not. Uh, and we'll look, we can look more at how to do that. But that's an example of correlating individual scores. So with all of these types of statistics, some of the things that we have to worry about are frequency distributions and how do we show this information. So there's different ways to show data. We can do things like show pie charts that show how many people fall into each category. We can show the same kind of information in bar charts. Um, we might have frequency polygons, so we have two different measurements here. We have the solid line and the dotted line, and that's showing a different value. Uh, or we might have histograms that are trying to show multiple variables on the same diagram. There's lots of different ways that we can show data, and one of the things that you want to think about in your particular study is what's the best way to present the data to make the case that you're trying to make. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about descriptive statistics as a starting point. So what descriptive statistics do, as the name says, they're descriptive. So they allow you to make precise statements about the data. So there's a couple of different kinds of general descriptive statistics we can think about. The first one is the central tendency. And basically, if you want to talk about that in plain language, that's what is the sample like on average? Um, and I'm using the word average, not in the mathematical sense there. And there's at least three different ways that we can do that. And these depend on what kind of variable uh, scale that you have. So if I have something that I can actually do strong math on, like an interval or ratio data, I'll take the mean, which is the mathematical average. If I have something that's interval where I don't know the distance between the data points, then I have to use the median because I can't rely on that same kind of math. And if I have something that's more nominal where I just have things in different categories, then I'm going to use the mode. That's just the most common value. So we have the central tendency and then we have the variability. And so the idea of the variability is it gives us some idea of how widespread the data is. So we can look at things like either standard deviation, which shows how far things vary from the central tendency, or we can look at the range, which is the minimum and the maximum. And again, depending on your data type and your study, you might use different ones of these as well. Many times we want to graph these relationships to just get a picture of the data. So when we're going to graph data, here's some general guidelines. So we put the levels of the independent variable on the x-axis, and we put the dependent variable on the y-axis. And remember, what's really important is the scale of the y-axis. So if we're going to use a bar chart, we use that more when the independent variable is nominal. So I have different groups across the x-axis. Uh, 
something like this. So I have uh, Coke A and Coke B, that's a nominal category, um, and I'm gonna do that on the x-axis. And just to point out with this chart as well, uh, I mentioned before that the scale of the axis is important. So you can see here uh, in this chart, on the left one, uh, we have the scale from zero to 100. On this right chart here, if I step out of the way, you'll see that we've shrunk the scale very much. Uh, it's just from 47 to 53, and we've made this difference actually look a whole lot bigger than it really is. So that's why the scale of the y-axis is really important. That's bar charts. Line charts, when our independent variable is a numerical category that I actually can put in order, I may want to use a line graph instead of a bar chart. And that's something more like this, where I have these values across the axis, uh, the x-axis that are numerical and the order matters, and I can connect the line to show the relationship of what's going on. Um, another concept that we might want to think about is correlation coefficients. And so if I have two variables that I'm plotting against each other, the correlation coefficient tells me something about how strongly related the two variables are. So you may have heard of the Pearson correlation. That's the most common one. Um, here's where our data uh, scales come into play. So in order to use this, my data has to be at least interval in both variables. Um, this value varies between 0 and plus or minus 1. And the number tells you the strength of the correlation. So the closer to 1, the stronger the correlation. The closer to 0, the weaker the correlation. And then the sign tells you the direction. So a positive 1 means they're, they're very strongly correlated in the same direction. That is, when one goes up, so does the other one. A negative 1 tells you they're very strongly correlated, but as an inverse. Meaning when one goes up, the other goes down. So here's an example of um, the, the correlation coefficient, the Pearson. So if I just plot some data on a scatter plot, uh, a positive correlation would look like the one on the left, a negative correlation would look like the one on the right. Um, and here's some, if you took some of this data that I have here as an example and just plot it on a chart, you could see things like this. So the, the top left one here is a positive correlation. It's not a one because you see some scatter in the data, but it is still a positive correlation. The one over here um, is a negative correlation. You still see it going down, but there's some scatter. The one down here, there is no relationship because you can't see a positive or a negative line. And um, I left a blank chart here. If you want to try to plot this data uh, yourself, you can see what it might look like. So this is an idea of what these correlations look like. Some of the things to think about with uh, Pearson correlations. Um, one is we have to think about the range. So it's important that we sample across the whole range of values uh, because if some things are missing, we might have some problems with our correlation. And we also have to worry about curvilinear relationships. So the ones that I just showed you were linear, but what happens if it's a curved relationship? The Pearson test won't test, catch that. We have to use another test. So when I say curvilinear, I mean something like this, that the value increases to some point and then it begins decreasing. Uh, so if we ran a Pearson correlation, there would look like there's actually no relationship here. But uh, there, in fact, is one. It's just curvilinear. One other basic concept that you might hear about and it's important to consider is the idea of effect size. And what the effect size is, is it shows you the strength of association between variables. This ranges between 0 and 1, so this is not a positive or negative, it's just 0 to 1. The higher the number, the better. And what it really does is it says, how strong is this, is this correlation? The idea of an effect size is something you can compute that across all different kinds of studies. And here's kind of a, a, a guide of what the effect sizes are. Uh, 0.15 or less is, is small. We have 0.3 gets up to medium. 0.4 or greater is large. Um, and as an example, the one I just showed you, the Pearson's R squared, that's an effect size measure. That's an example of the measure. And what it's doing is it's showing you the percentage of the variance that's shared by the two variables. So when I think about effect size, I can look at this across different studies and actually compare different kinds of statistics. Uh, Another thing to think about when I'm looking at how variables relate to each other is regression equations. And these may be something you might think about in your studies. Here you would predict the score of one variable based on the score of the other variables. So a simple one is this form here, y equals a plus bx. And it says something like, if I know the value for x, I can plug it into my equation and I can compute an estimate for the value of y. Um, and in some cases, if I have multiple variables that I want to use to predict, I could have a multiple correlation there as well. So this is another tool in your toolbox for describing the data and making inferences about it. So when I say inferences, so let me go now to the second uh, set of data. 
or a second set of statistics. And these are the ones that we probably are, are more familiar with. These are the inferential statistics. And so with these, what we're trying to do is we're trying to actually draw some conclusions about the data. So the idea of inferential statistics says that any one study that I run, I have results, but it's only based on one sample from the population. So I have to wonder, um, be able to answer the question like, okay, well, would this same result happen if I ran the study in a different situation? So would the result hold up if the experiment or the study was conducted repeatedly each time with a different sample? So how likely is it that my results going to hold up? So inferential statistics help us know how strong a statement we can make. Can we make a statement about the entire population based on the observed sample or not? Um, and again, the idea here is, is regardless of how well we do in planning and controlling our, our study, there's going to be differences between the groups because we're dealing with people. And so there's going to have some random error. I, I end up putting people in groups. There's things about them that I didn't know to measure. So there's going to be some random error that's going to impact the independent variable um, or in, in impact the result even if the independent variable did not. And so when I actually think about what I see in a study, I'm really having a combination of the true difference versus some sort of random error. And what I want to be able to do is understand a little bit how strong is this random error and how much does it affect my study. Okay, so given that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a hypothesis. So I have two types of hypotheses that I think about. Um, I have a null hypothesis, which basically says the population means are equal. So I have two ways to do something. My null hypothesis says there's no effect. Uh, so any, any difference that I observe is going to be because of random error. And then my research hypothesis is the inverse of that. It says that the means are not equal. That is, the independent variable, the thing that I did, actually had some sort of an effect. So the idea here when I run a statistical test, this is kind of thinking backwards a little bit because the idea is I'm trying to test whether or not the null hypothesis is correct. I'm not actually testing the research hypothesis. I'm testing the hypothesis that there is no difference. So like I said, the null hypothesis is that very precise statement that the means are not equal. And so what I'm doing is I'm calculating the probability that I would have observed what I did if the null hypothesis was correct. So for example, if I saw a difference in the two groups, how likely is it that I would have seen a difference if there really was no difference present? And so when I run a statistical test, what I'm doing is I'm going to reject the null hypothesis when that probability is so small that I would have seen something if it wasn't there. And the idea of statistical significance says that result has such a low probability that it's unlikely that it was due to random error. It's more likely that it was due to the independent variable. So this brings into account a couple of concepts, probability being one of the key ones. So just a quick reflection on probability. Um, probability just talks about the likelihood that something's going to occur. So for example, what's the likelihood of observing that difference if there really wasn't one present? And what's the probability of the reserved result, observed result of only random errors present? So again, if that probability is very, very, very low, then I'm going to reject the possibility that only random error caused the observation. I'm going to accept the research hypothesis. So this is the idea of how do I run a statistical test and actually interpret the result. So how do we decide what that level is? Well, this is what we call the alpha level, and we choose this beforehand. Most of the time, this is something like 0.05, for example. So the alpha level is important. The sampling distribution is important. So I need to know something about the, how the data is distributed. Is it binomial? Is it normal, et cetera? And then I need to know something about the sample size. So as the sample size increases, smaller differences become significant because now I have more and more data points. So there's less of a chance that random error is affecting the overall result. So these are all three important factors here. So that brings us to this idea of statistical significance. And so what the uh, st statistical significance does is it allows you to make a decision about whether those results that you uh, got are reliable. So how confident, if I went and ran this study again in a different setting, how confident am I that I would get the same results a second time? So that alpha level tells you how confident do I want to be when I make a decision. So the lower I pick that number, so 0.01 versus 0.05, the more confident I can be. So if I choose 0.01, that means there's only a 1% chance of random error causing it. If I choose 0.05, that means there's a 5% chance. So that significance level is, is my confidence. And like I said, a larger sample size is more likely to produce significant results.
And you're also more likely to get significant results if the effect size is large. So there's really two ways to increase my chances. Have a big difference between the two groups or have big groups. So when I run a statistical test, the things I need to specify are what are the null hypothesis and what is the statistic, the significance level that I'm going to use to determine my result. There's two types of tests. Uh, you might have heard of these. One, the first one is called a one-tailed test, which basically just says, um, or which says that the, the research hypothesis indicates the direction of the difference. So my, my research hypothesis would say approach A is better than approach B. So I'm, I'm making a one-tailed, I'm making a directional hypothesis, whereas the two-tailed hypothesis does not uh, inf, uh, choose a direction. It just says there's a difference. So that hypothesis would say something like, treatment A is different than treatment B, but I don't know how it's going to be different. And the reason that this matters is if we look at a plot of the way the probability distributions look, uh, this is a normal distribution. And if I say I'm going to use a 0.05 uh, as, a, as my significance level, if I'm doing a one tail test, I, that 0.05 is all in one end of the distribution. So my, my significance can be or my difference can be a little bit smaller, but if I'm doing a two-tail test where I'm testing, testing both ends, I've got to split that 5% between both tails. That's why it's called one-tail versus two-tail. We could talk more about that if you have specific questions, but that's the, the conceptual idea. So when we think about our hypotheses and choosing our alpha value, we can have these different problems that may happen. Um, we have type 1 and type 2 errors. So those are the most common ones we want to worry about. And type 1 is usually what we're most concerned with. And type 1 error says that the null hypothesis is true, which means there's no difference, but I reject it. So the higher I make my alpha value, the more likely it is that I'm going to make a type 1 error. So if I make my alpha value 0.1 instead of 0.01, I'm going to be more likely to actually say there's a difference when there's really not one. Type 2 errors are the opposite. Type 2 errors uh, are probably less risky. That's saying I'm going to accept the null hypothesis, meaning I'm going to say there's no difference when there really is one. And again, we can talk more about this, but the one that's most concerning is the alpha, uh, the alpha value. That's the one you need to worry the most about. Um, so the effect size, uh, as I mentioned a little bit before, that represents the magnitude of the effect. So here's an example of how you might compute effect size. This doesn't really matter except just to kind of expose you to it. Um, the t-statistic is something I'll mention in a minute about the t-test, but you can, here's one formula for computing effect size. Um, and I showed you those ranges just a minute ago. Okay, so how do I choose a statistical test? Um, this chart I borrowed from a book that I'm uh, mentioning down here, Statistical Methods for Psychology from Howell. It's a really good reference book. Um, what you have to think about is what kind of data do you have? So do you have nominal, ordinal, or interval or ratio? And then how many groups do you have? One, two, etc. And this chart gives you a handy reference for deciding which test you should use. It's, it's not complete, but it's, it's a good place to start. Um, and and I, we can talk again more about spe specific tests as you get into your studies themselves. So for two samples, let's just start with a very basic one just to give a quick overview. If I have two samples, the most common one that I'm going to use is the t-test. Okay. There's a couple of assumptions. It assumes that the data is normally distributed. And if I have a reasonably large sample, that assumption is, is typically met, although we could talk more advanced about how you might test that and decide which approach you want to use. It's based on a distribution like all of them. This one is the T distribution. And what we do is we compute the value of the T statistic and then we determine how likely that value would have been if the null hypothesis is true. Now you're going to have a, t a tool most likely, R, SPSS, something like that, doing it for you. So I, you'll probably never do this by hand, but the idea here is just to show you what's happening underneath the hood. Okay. So what a t-test is, it's a, it's a ratio of the group difference. So how, how far apart are group A and group B? I'll, a ratio of that difference to the within group variability. That means how consistent are the measures in group A and how consistent are the measures in group B. So here's what it looks like uh, in general. So it's the group difference over the within group variability. This is the formula. I won't go through that. You, you can look at it later. But basically the idea is 
the way that you want a large T value to get a significant result. So there's two ways to get that value large. One is if the group difference is large, that increases the value of T, or if the within group variability is small. That means each of my groups are really consistent in their measures. Either one of those will increase the value of the T statistic. So if you wonder why your result may not be significant, it's one of those two things. Either there's too much variability or there's not enough difference between the groups. There's a few different types of t-tests that you might think about using depending on uh, what, your, what your study looks like. So the first one, the most simple one, is a one-sample t-test. This is not used all that often, but it's the, you only have one sample. So you take the mean of the whole sample and you see if that mean is significantly different from some hypothesized mean. Um, we can look at that if that's an issue. Match samples t-test. Um, this is, we talked about repeated measures design or match pairs design or repeated samples. Um, these are, this is the test you use with that. And basically it computes the difference between each pair. So if I'm in treatment A and treatment B, it's going to compute the difference in my performance in those two treatments. It's going to do that for all the participants. And then it's going to do a one sample t-test to see if that difference is significantly different from zero. And then the one that I just mentioned that's probably the more common one is the independent samples t-test. And that's when I have two independent groups. So I have one group of people doing treatment A, one group of people doing treatment B. Uh, then I want to take those and uh, take into account the sample means and the sample variance. And that's what I mentioned, not an earlier lecture, but, but a previous slide, um, what that looks like. A slightly more uh, advanced version is the F-test. Um, sometimes you might see this called an ANOVA. This is kind of a generalization of the T-test. It can handle more factors, more variables. You could have two different kinds of F-tests. A one-way, you may have heard of a one-way ANOVA, or these can also deal with what we call factorial designs where there's multiple independent variables. So that's when it's really useful. So if I have if I only have two levels of my independent variable, I can do a t-test. But if I have three levels, I can't do it. When I say levels, I mean like three groups. I have group A, group B, and group C. Or if I have multiple independent variables that I'm trying to test. That's what we call a factorial design. And it's the same idea as the t-test. It just looks slightly different. It's, it's a ratio, still a ratio of two variances. So the systematic variance, so that's the between group difference. Uh, and then the error variance, that's the within group difference. They're just computed slightly differently because we have more groups. But it's in practice, it's a very similar formula as the one before. So uh, let me look at categorical data here for a minute. I'm just going to put all this up here. So if I have categorical data, I'm going to use something called a chi-squared test. So if I have a nominal variable where I have these categories, and this I'm just going to say they're colors, um, and I have some data and I categorize them, and it looks like this. Okay, so then what I typically have is I have an, an expected distribution, which is over here. I, maybe I expect them all to be the same. And then I have my observed distribution, what I, what I ended up with. So instead of running a t-test, in this case, I'm going to run a chi-squared test. And right, as I say here, chi-squared refers both to the mathematical distribution, but also the statistical test that tells us what's happening. And it's the same exact idea. We have a null hypothesis that says what we observed is not significantly different than what we expected. We run that test and if we get a less than 0.05 or 0.01 or whatever our alpha value is, then we can conclude this didn't happen by chance. It happened because of some, some systematic difference going on. There's a few other kinds of chi-square tests. Um, one is what we call the goodness of fit test. So that was what I just showed you. How good is there a fit between what I observe and what I expected? So let me give you a simple example. Let's say I have a mouse and I train him where the cheese is. I have one, this little path here. And we do this a bunch of times. And my question is, does the mouse learn the path to the cheese or does the mouse learn physically where the cheese is located? So then I might keep the cheese in the same place keep the mouse in the same place, but change my tunnels a little bit. So, so now if, if the mouse followed the path, it, it would be more likely to go up B, but if the mouse knew where the cheese was, it'd be more likely to go up D. And what I could do is that I could do this a number of times, count how many times the mouse shows in each one, and then I can run a test to see if there's actually any difference there from a, a random distribution. If the mouse learns nothing, you would expect A, B, C, and D to all have the same number of attempts. We can also think about a chi-squared test between two variables. So now if I have data that's categorized on two or more variables, I'm interested in whether those variables are independent uh, or if the distribution is contingent on 
the other one. So again, this would be an example where I have two nominal variables, two categorical variables, and I build what's called a contingency table that shows the distribution of one variable at each level of the other one. So let me show you an example, um, a very simple example. Let's say that I have um, a bunch, this is, this is a real example from a book, we have a bunch of data on court cases. And so we have guilty verdicts and we have not guilty verdicts. And then we also have a poll after the case that asked the jury, how much fault did you put on the victim? So if they, if they thought the victim had very little fault in, in the crime versus having the victim having a lot of fault in the crime. And so what you can see here is the distribution is a little bit different. So if they didn't think the victim had any fault, it was overwhelmingly guilty. Um, if they put uh, some fault, a high level of fault on the victim, we see a little bit of a shift more towards not guilty. And then what we eventually can do is we can run a chi-squared test here to see if this distribution is any different significantly than what we would have found by just doing a, an even distribution. So what happens, and again, your, your tool will do this, but the expected value, it computes it for each cell, and it computes that by multiplying the total for the row total for the column and dividing it by n. So if everything was even, the expected value for guilty would be 177 times 258 divided by the overall total of 358. So I would do that for all of them and then I would run a test to see, do I actually see a difference there? Okay. Uh, I can also do this with, with two uh, variables. So I can have variables that have more than two levels. Um, I can do this in the same way. So here's an example where I had two variables, but one of them had three levels. So I would do the same kind of test, um, and the math would just look very similar. Uh, one other thing I want to mention that's more of an nominal thing is something that might be useful called Cohen's Kappa. So this uses a contingency table, just like the one I showed you, but it's actually computing a different statistic here. It's computing the Kappa. And this measures inter-rater, inter-judge reliability. So this would be an example of when I had multiple people looking at the same thing, how reliable are their ratings? So that, that's an example. Maybe I have two people grading assignments and I want to see how reliable are their ratings. Or I have people judging a science fair and I want to see how consistent their judgments are in the science fair. There's different ways that I might, might use that kind of test. But it really what it's doing is it's computing the percentage of agreement. So. With that, um, hopefully that was a very quick introduction to quantitative methods. Um, we can talk more about any of those as they relate to your individual projects. Thank you.